Stanford University. I think you're going to find this class a lot of fun. Uh, you're going to meet some really interesting people. Uh, present company, except for him, accepted. <laughs> uh, but uh, w David and I were asked today to explain how has the Valley changed since we first got here? What are the changes and disruptive innovations in venture capital, and how will these changes play out the next 10 to 15 years? So I have this model I call the Cycles of Innovation model. I thought I'd just present to you today to give you a little feel about Silicon Valley and where we've come from and where we've been and then where, we're, where I think, the, at least my model forecasts, we're going to go. And it is about uh, disruptive innovations. Uh, then you'll have a lot more fun with uh, David because he has a way of making everything into a kind of fun little parable, <laughs> comic, uh, uh, Greek tragedy. <laughs> so, um, but, here, but this is important because it's lost often. I'm always telling the truth. I, people think I'm making jokes and therefore I'm saying things that, oh, those are funny, but not true. It's always the truth. It's always funny, but it's always the truth. So don't, be, don't confuse the two. Because there'll be moments where you're like, oh my God, that's, so, it, that's insane and funny, but not true. It's true. So I will let you know if I'm making it up. All right. So let me get started. First, uh, I, I want to try to emphasize how uh, important what, what's going on right now is because I believe it's by far the biggest uh, we're by far the biggest inflection point in, in human history and um, you can see what I think my the three inflection points are uh, Sloan did a study about productivity increases because everything about better qualities of life and not living in caves anymore is about productivity being able to produce more goods and services uh, with uh, uh, with less resources um, the uh, up until all the way uh, from the dawn of mankind until the first industrial revolution, their outcome was a 30% in improvement in productivity. So that gave us cities and religions and armies and stuff like that. The two industrial revolutions gave us a 100% increase in productivity, so we finally got a middle class, right? Their prediction for the next 100 years is a 1,000% increase in productivity. So. They, it's hard to even fathom what that means to, uh, to mankind. Um, and right now, I think this particular decade, and that's why I'll show you as I go through this model, is the biggest, is the inflection point of that inflection point. Um, and it's based on you know, what I call the cloud and the web. And when I talk about the cloud, I'm talking about, about what what will become the utility that provides all the services and reaches out to everything, including the Internet of Things. When I'm talking about the web, it's the things that are on the end of the cloud interacting in any, every way, like us and all the other things. Uh, but th that'll become a little more clear. Uh, so first, I love Peter Drucker. Um, you know, uh, several things about, uh, about my talk comes from Peter Drucker, but this particular saying, I sort of think, uh, you'll see my last quote here from Mark Twain, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it sometimes rhymes. And that's why, uh, you know, I think having a model of how you think things are developing gives you something to measure it against. And I had to actually developed this model in 2000, and I update it every couple of years. But um, the, the first thing is disruptive innovation is the basis for, for, uh, for massive change, for, for really moving things forward. And, um, a disruptive innovation, according to Drucker, is something that, that number one, it's, it's represented by an order of magnitude improvement in the value proposition of those who, that are consuming it. That order of magnitude is really important because you, you can go, I, I learned this in IT a long time ago, you can go to an IT shop and tell them, and sh demonstrate to them, I can cut their cost by 50% and they're not going to buy anything because they're not measured on that. They're measured on keeping things going. But if it's a disruptive innovation that the board and the, uh, and the CEO are looking at every day that says, you know, if I don't do something about this, my competition is going to take market share from me. That's what, that's what really motivates change. Also, the thing about it is if it is an order of magnitude uh, change and it's happening rapidly, the, if we look back in the dis uh, over the last 40 years, Every one of those disruptive changes, the winner was a startup. 
So the winner are little companies like Microsoft and Oracle and Intel and Cisco, but in their disruption, and I'll show you what the disruptions are. So the interesting thing about cycles of innovation is, uh, is they're actually 30 years long, and one starts every 10 years. And following the IT, the set of IT uh, innovations, I forecast there will be a total of six, and we're in four and five right now. Um, so the last 30 years, because the first 10 years is invention, and then some gets big enough that all of a sudden there's a boom and it's going to change the world, and a big explosion in investment, but we haven't yet figured out how to actually monetize that. We haven't figured out how to make it useful. So there's usually a bust. Um, the second 10 years, we figure that out. We, we, I call it build out and consolidation. And then the thir third 10 years is commoditization. So the first cycle, I'll just use the first cycle as an example. It was a semiconductor cycle. It began late 50s, early 60s. Uh, uh, when, uh, when the semiconductor and integrated circuit were, were invented. But it took most of that decade to get to the point that all of a sudden we can do something with this. So at the late 60s, 60s there were dozens of semiconductors companies founded in this valley. And they built their foundries in this va valley. Um, the problem was by 1970, Intel was hand assembling memory, memory chips. So we're not going to get a very efficient market that way. So the build out meant we had to make it efficient, right? then what that meant is we had to invent uh, semiconductor manufacturing equipment. We had to invent equipment to actually apply these things, CAD, CAM, and what was something that was called in-circuit emulators at the time. Um, and that we had to be able to go out and train the Collins radio engineer how to throw away his tubes and use transistors so that an ordinary person can do it. That's the first part of, the, of what happens during the build-out. The second part of what happens is the industry consolidates. Because nobody needs dozens of startup uh, companies doing semiconductors, especially if you're Collins Radio and you're going to bet your $500 million business on a startup here that may not exist. So by the end of that decade, we're down to three really good new, start, new companies in that business. There are a lot of others doing specially, but there are three that were becoming you know, pretty darn big, National Semiconductor, uh, Intel, and Texas Instruments. That the build-out phase is important because that's where the value is created. If we think back to the boom period in the 90s, yes, the internet was being invented, but the build-out was going on for the set cycle before it, which was networking itself. And that's where all the money was made. And that's what really created the value then. It wasn't until the decade of 2000 to 2010 that the internet reached its first build-out phase, which I'll show you in a few minutes. And that's because it wasn't, until 2000, we, no, we did, nobody, nobody was deploying Wi-Fi and nobody was deploying 3G. And you remember that old movie, uh, uh, you know, uh, I forget what it was called, where uh, it was all about AOL, and all you, but you had to listen to the telephone coupler. Nobody bought stuff online then. But when they built, when the, wire, when the broadband went out and built it out, it went crazy. So that second one's really important. Commoditization is the easy one. Uh, so between 70 and 80, we had build out of semiconductors. 80 and 90 was commoditization. Uh, several things happened. One is chips were really being mass produced. And it used to be the rule, you made all your money in the first six months. So you wanted to get there first. Because you could sell your chip at $100 the first six months. Then you dropped it to 10, then you dropped it to one. And so it was all about how fast you can move. It became mass production. And then we also invented foundries. So you didn't even have to build your own, your, uh, your own foundries anymore. Things just went crazy. So these things keep repeating themselves. <clears throat> there are, I contend there are, three, there are six cycles. I'll show you a uh, uh, little more about them in a minute. Uh, well, I can talk about them right now. Semiconductor was the first one. In the next decade, we began to build computers on it. So that was the second one and that invented the mini computers and things like that. In the third cycle, we began to build, to build, to invent the network as we know it today, not the proprietary ones like SNA and all those that existed before that. Then, we, then in 1990, we began to invent, well, about 1991, 92, when the World Wide Web came about, uh, the internet as we know it. Uh, the, 
Now, the internet is actually composed of, I, I contend, three value propositions that will you know, constitute the three, uh, the three cycles of innovation for it. The first one was free reach. That's just what it sounds like. Anybody could reach anybody or any combination of anybody from the edges for free. And that's, you know, the first time that was actually able to happen. That's what turned into the social networking and all the stuff you see that's really being, making big bucks today on the IPO market. Delayed several years because of the, the downturn that happened, but right now the, mo the monetization of free reach is really happening. And we're in the last decade of, that, of those 30 years. The, um, the second one, though, is the, is the really interesting one. I, that, and that, this is what is really going to change the world. And that is uh, what I call uh, straight through processing. But what it means is that we're now figuring out how to mash up things that are going on and how to get the big data analytics so that we can actually change business models. We can change the behavior. We can monetize that social stuff. And ultimately, that's going to change the whole way commerce is done. Commerce historically has been what we call the push model, which is capitalism. I spent a huge amount of money, capital, to build factories, and then to create inventories, then to build products, and then to push them out in a long supply chain, and then you get to buy any color you want as long as it's black, as, Fo as Ford said, right? The, the model that, that this is going to is Everything is just the opposite. It's a pull model. It's the better you can serve the individual in the, in the situation they're in right then with a unique product or service, the more business you're going to do. And that's going to take decades to get there. But we, we can't, we, the ability to actually connect those things in real time is what's being built out now. Now, this valley, one of the major changes that has happened, you know, my 40 years in this valley, Every place in the world has said they're going to be in the next Silicon Valley. And we finally have the next Silicon Valley. It happens to be San Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, well, I'm not kidding. You know, there have been more companies founded in this decade than any previous comparable period in this valley. But there have been more companies founded in S San Francisco than here. There's a difference. This is mostly still the high-tech infrastructure, data, blah, 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 network, you know, hardware. That's mostly, you know, the... Zynga, uh, uh, Airbnb, um, Ubers, the, the stuff that's really leveraging the web, you know, and it's a whole next generation of, uh, of things that are happening. But they're synergistic, and, uh, and uh, this valley is now just extended. It's just a lot bigger. Um, so that's, what we're, that's the phase we're in that, on that right now. The final one is what I call transparency, and it's way beyond big data. It's, it's how do you take all this massive amount of data that's going to increase dramatically, and in real time, in context to what, what you're doing, uh, have, be, able to be able to create an ontology, have an ontology created for you in context of what you're doing to understand the information that can be, make it actionable. Now, that sounds a little uh, technical, but the issue is massive amounts of data. You want to be able to, to act or, be, or interact on it in real time. And current database structures do not, current database structures presuppose how you're going to query that information. So you need more of an associative model. And it'll take, we're just, in the, we're just inventing that kind of thing. So the first phase is just going to be big data analytics, which is going to make huge amounts of money. But it's going to go a lot farther than that, I contend. So the, uh, we're basically right now, at this point, this decade is when the cloud is being built out, and I, I include the Internet of Things as part of the extension of the cloud. And this decade is when we're figuring out how to really monetize all the things that are going on out there. So lots of business models are going to be created in, in this day, decade like, uh, like we've never seen before. In the next decade, it's, those are going to be commoditized, and uh, the rate of acceleration of change is going to really increase. So I've talked about disruptive innovation. I've, talk, I've actually talked about this slide. So I don't want you to have to look at this. We'll, we'll put this up so you can take it down. You don't have to see everything that's on it. But that, this is just a diagram layout of how those cycles proceed. The, um, good, I've got seven minutes left, and that's about what I have left. So you can see how we've gone all the way through here. Right now, we're sitting in this decade. Uh, this decade. And, uh, the real key is what's happening right here. 
Um, we're, yes, we're inventing stuff for transparency for the next decade. And, uh, you know, we're, we're basically, uh, the, the market is going to begin to um, solidify as far as free reach goes. I mean, the thing about free reach and the social side is they're not a, uh, they're not a standard differenti differentiation, normal normalized curve kind of marketplace. They're uh, power law distribution. So the biggest player in a free reach when everybody can be reached in the world at the same cost, the biggest player in these kind of markets has such a network effect that the next biggest player is just trivial next to them. So that's what's happened to Facebook and that's what's happened to, to Google and it'll happen, you know, across those spaces and then they'll uh, continue them to uh, morph. But, the, uh, but those, those kind of inventions, we're going to see fewer and fewer of them that are so horizontal that, uh, that they can create big, massive global markets. A lot of what's going to happen out of leveraging these things is going to be more in, um, in vertical markets. Uh, Leveraging big data analytics to uh, to change the buying uh, the whole buying uh, uh, relationship. So we'll put this online. You can have it. Matter of fact, I'll, I'll, there's a 21-page paper that accompanies this that gives the how the all the things that happen. But the interesting part here is, so the first three cycles were the invention of the data center is really what it was. You know, the semiconductor network and uh, and computer. The cloud actually uh, is the end of disruptive innovations for IT, ICT, that's IT and communications. And now why, how can I possibly say that? Well, think of a world in which everything is running on, on, on a utility internet. It's all basically horizontal IP uh, based services that you are consuming and you're consuming them just based on an open mass market. Uh, the, there's no differentiation at the infrastructure as a service level between who's providing what. So what that evolves into after this utility is really invented, this um, built out this quarter, next quarter in commoditization, every telephone company in the world, every cable company in the world, every ISP company in the world are selling the exact same thing. It's, it's just the same thing. It doesn't work to a telephone call or a TV show or a a nuclear bomb simulation or running your ERP. It's just a bunch of services that you buy. So there's going to be massive consolidation across that. Now what could possibly disrupt that? No matter what you do underneath that, all it's going to do is make it better, faster, cheaper. It's not going to ca cause you to throw it out, at least not in the lifetimes that I, that I can envision. So there's no disruptive innovation for in ITC after that. There'll be lots of, you know, it's There'll be lots of changes, but we'll, we basically, even if we invented um, quantum computing and made it cheap for everybody, all it would do would be make it faster and make it more efficient. It wouldn't change the model. So what's left is the disruptive innovation going forward after the cloud is really all having to do with the web. It's about how we live and what this does to our life. Um, so say, so ask what are you know what I think the the venture trends are. Uh, you know, g going back a few years, virtualization has gone crazy. Everything's being vir virtualized. Uh, predictive analytics and matching that with, uh, with big data. Uh, the monetization of social, I think, is the biggest thing of all. I mean, that is the whole, whole next big wave. Uh, Software-defined everything, data centers, are infrastructure investment. This is just a slide I, we put together for things that we're doing in our fund. 3D printing. That's going to change the concept of manufacturing and just in time, and it's also going to make this whole thing of the pull economy. I want it, I want it now, and I want it the way I want it. Very, very feasible. Trusted networks. The biggest issue we're going to have going into the Internet of Things is identity, because unless we can solve the identity problem, in which you can have, a, you can have an anonymous identity, but you can, never, you, you can never pose to be someone else meaning that uh, you don't have to pass your personal identifying information, but the, the, uh, the authenticator, the authenticating service ends up being something part of, that's part of the uh, internet uh, that can authenticate you using, uh, um, using known authorities, 
like, okay, I, I, you know, I want to know it's Bill Coleman. Uh, I've got his driver's, we've got access to his driver's license. I can't look at it, but I can ask that that, become, that, that fingerprint and picture be compared with the person trying to, in real time, so I can get at least two, two th things there. You can do dozens of those kind of things in real time with almost no interaction. Once you've, we've done that, you eliminate almost all possibility of fraud or cybercrime. But more than that, you make it possible for, for us to actually live on this world. Think of the Internet of Things. If everything in this room was on the Internet of Things, how would it know how to authenticate your you? Are you going to register yourself in an LDAP for every device you're ever going to run into in your life? Security can't work that way. We have to solve the identity problem. And by the way, every pe people are on top of once, but once that happens, things are going to really accelerate. And of course, the Internet of Things. So my last slide is: uh, it, it by 2040, uh, I actually believe that first that we will be uh, directly inter uh, directly interfacing with the internet. So that's going to change a lot. Uh, I I call that web presence, where your, your virtual lives and your physical lives meet. You guys are going to live through that. Um, uh, I believe the pull economy will be the basis of everything. You know, we'll go from mass marketing to micro marketing, mass production to micro production. It, it will make things dramatically more capital efficient. Therefore, uh, the velocity of capital can increase a lot. Therefore, productivity will cr increase even faster. Identity will be solved. And I really think that this whole idea of your identity is something you control. It also is something you, sh you can assign uh, tasks to, and it can be a proxy for you in this internet world. So we're, uh, we're going to live in a really, really interesting time. And uh, I'm jealous because uh, you all guys are going to get to all go get, and gals, I'm sorry, in, in the generic sense, are going to get to go invent it. And uh, Stanford is the best place in the world to do it. So on my chart there, you notice that as it ended, there were some blank spaces at the top. And I think that we're starting just very, in a trivial, trivial way, to think about that based on 3D printing. But the re reality is, you know, at the molecular level where nano meets bio, there's no difference. And when we can manipulate that at that level, that's what's, you know, I, uh, I think it's going to be three to six or maybe eight to sets of disruptive innovations that are going to change our relationship with what we are and who we do in this planet and resources. And it's going to be an interesting time. So. Yes, sir. Uh, I noticed on that slide you didn't have like wearables or, or like Bitcoin stuff. Um, I'm just curious if you don't think those wearables are, are, are just part of the Internet of Things. Oh, so you can consider those two. Yeah. Same, right? Yeah. Uh, they they uh, th just things become, right. you know, become more a part of your day to day life. And you know. Right. And what about Bitcoin or like cryptocurrencies? Yeah. I you know I actually think that uh, that the crypto solution. Uh, is not a, not a bad solution. Uh, the the problems with it relate to uh, uh, mostly uh, relate to what happens in bad when bad things happen. Where, what's your fallback? What's your safety net? Um, you know that's what you know, we've spent 600 or some years since the Dutch building up a, da a banking system where we figured out how to have some degrees of protections and fallbacks and you know, federal banks and things like that. But, uh, uh, but I think it's going to, I, I, I don't think Bitcoin is the answer. I think it's, a, I think it's leading us down a correct path. Yes, sir. Well, first, thank you for hosting us. Uh, my question is about the innovation cycles. Uh -huh. um, you show us this table with always having the same le length. You know, ten years. It's just a. It, it's it's just an approximate. Yeah, on average. But why? What do you think will be the like the disruption that will enable us to actually shorten those cycles even more? Like I don't know, five, three, two years. Because during the last I, I don't know, like thirty years, uh, the way venture capitalists mm -hmm. has been running their business is pretty much the same. So maybe you can actually disrupt your own industry. Uh, well, so I have. Uh, I've been asked that question a number of times. So I have two opposing answers, because I haven't got it straight in my mind. The first, the first answer is, you know, it would seem obvious that at some point uh, the, uh, these, the timing could be cut, right? And, and things would move faster and faster. But 
On the, uh, but the other side of it, I actually think there is something having to do with uh, uh, human nature and the ability to evolve and the ability to adjust to. Um, there's also something that, you know, 30 years is about the length of a normal career. And uh, I, I was asked to do a study with, uh, uh, for the CTO, to be part of the study for the CTO of the Department of Defense after the second Iraq war, the hot part of it ended. And, uh, to what define what was the difference between Iraq War One and Iraq War Two, and we came out the number one difference was the generals had grown up with computers. I mean, they were willing to trust to have the planes and everything pre-done and aut the the systems in Florida to acquire targets that were put into the Abrams tanks to shoot down the you know, to shoot at the you know the armored vehicle over the hill, you know, all in real time. So I, I don't know, I, uh, I, I, there is some part of it that has to do with how long it takes to actually get technologies move forward and get them adopted and, you know, and build the, figure out what the business models are and people accept the business models and. All right, now, now, the, now the prime time comes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so uh, is a bubble or a crash kind of part of your cycle and I, I wonder if you think that we are closing to the bubble at this moment right now. I'm just curious. Uh, I, I think that a, a bubble is part of my model uh, and uh, some crashes are bigger and some are smaller uh, but I don't think we're anywhere near uh, the bubble yet. I think the, the part of the market that's overheated is the monetization of, the, uh, of free reach with all everybody that's coming to the stock market now, right? Uh, and some of the monetization of cloud, but mostly it's, it's the big social stocks and all. Uh, they may, they're not driving the economy. They're not, uh, they're ha the, uh, the, the investment, the venture folks have been investing in them for a long, long time. I personally believe if we're gonna have a bubble, uh, a, 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 a real bubble and a bust, it's gonna happen in uh, five to six or seven years, because I think it's going to be on the over hyping of the uh, this whole move to a pull economy. We're gonna, well, I, I predict we're going to go back to something akin to everybody talking about bricks and mortar and you know manufacturing that old style. That you know, and then of course it won't be true because we won't have gone far enough to to really have and will have invented it. We'll be building it out, but now applying it to the next generation. But okay, now you're gonna have a fun guy. Well, you've set me up to suck. Oh, ah, no. <laughs> oh, no, that's, <laughs> that's all I'm saying. Plus, my topic is so extraordinarily exciting: the evolution of the venture capital industry, which is uh, scintillating. Um, and what? And you want me to? Do this in 10, who's, who's in charge here? It's not me. 10, 20, whatever, 15. Once we'll, you're done we'll, see how, we'll see how, we'll see what it takes. We'll see what it takes. You guys can all, you know, if, you, if you're tired of me, just put your finger on your nose. And eventually when there's consensus, I'll just stop. Um, so uh, uh, I'm David Hornick. I've been now in the venture capital industry for uh, almost 15 years, I started out, I'll give you the very short version, which is grew up in New Hampshire. My dad was an computer, early computer scientist. I came to Stanford. Uh, I studied computer music. It qualified me to do nothing. Uh, I, went to, uh, I went and got a master's degree in criminology. Um, I'm not quite sure what that qualified me to do, but I hope I never do it. Uh, I then went to law school and, that, uh, and got a law degree, which qualified me to be an attorney. Um, I did do that for a brief period of time. I was a litigator in New York for a period of time uh, and then came out to Silicon Valley to start representing startups. I uh, didn't know what startups were at the time, but had the good fortune of having been in the same freshman dorm as Jerry Yang and the founders of Yahoo. And they seemed to be having a good time <laughs> and, uh, and were uh, onto something pretty exciting. And so I came out and started representing startups. And, um, and within about three seconds of starting to represent startups, I realized that startups are about the most exciting thing on the planet. That, uh, that you know, Silicon Valley is a place where you create these businesses that are out of whole cloth based on the ideas and, the, and just the, the guts and, and determination of really smart, engaged people. And it's hard to imagine a better 
you know, a better thing to, to be part of, right? I mean, I thought I was going to be a, um, I thought I was going to be an entertainment lawyer. I liked, I liked music. I liked movies. I thought I was going to be an entertainment attorney. And then I got, I, I talked to people who were doing that job and realized that it was, while the end product was exciting, pretty much everything leading up to it sucked. Um, and while the venture business and, and the startup world, um, there are many, many, many minutes of sucking, many minutes of, you know, God, this isn't going to work, or how am I going to make it work, or I'm going to run out of money, or, I, or someone just quit who I really needed, or I thought I was going to hire the right person and they refused to join us, or, or worse yet, uh, you know, I, I thought I was going to fund an exciting company and then, they, and then I didn't get to fund them and then they became massive or why did I never see it? I mean, there are all sorts of reasons why the venture business is extraordinarily hard and, and, on, and only as a byproduct of how hard it is to start companies, right? Um, I, I often say that venture capitalists, the venture capital is a derivative business, right? We don't do anything. We just, we back great entrepreneurs. We help them in lots of ways if we do our job right. But in the end, entrepreneurs are the ones who are building all the value. And if we're lucky, we are uh, assisting the right set of, set of entrepreneurs. And if they're successful, we are successful um, as, as a byproduct of their success, which is uh, an amazing position to be in. But when you think about it, it it's, it's both good and bad. It means that there are lots of people working really hard on your behalf. Um, but there also is very little control, right? I mean, you people talk about this. Oh, you know, don't VCs are trying to control your business, and VCs create these this stock that has all these controls and management. It's all baloney. Like we do, yeah. I have preferred stock, and it has things like you can't sell your company unless I vote to agree to sell your company. Um, but when you think about it, if there's a team of people who've built a company and they would like to sell the business and I say no, then what happens? I go run the business? Who, like what, what is the alternative to saying yes to, I want to sell the business? Or in the alternative, you people should sell the business. No, we don't want to. What, I'm going to go run around and find a buyer? It's just so it, so it turns out that as a general matter, startups are driven by the entrepreneurs who run them and own them and manage them. The venture investors are a, are, are a supporting cast of characters. We are here to help you by giving you capital to, to help grow and expand and, and, um, and, uh, and come build a business at the speed and, and with the agility that you hope to have. Um, and in the end, be helpful in lots of ways, but you're going to build your business and you're going to determine its fate. Um, when I was asked to join August Capital, I had been an attorney, I w and my partner said, hey, David, we'd like you to join us and be an investor. They said, you know what? Lawyers suck at this job, and you will likely fail, which I thought was a nice vote of confidence. Uh, it's a welcome, you know. Um, but I said, oh, you know, okay, I'm excited about this business. I had seen it from the side of representing companies and representing VCs, but I hadn't been a venture investor. I got here, and I, uh, and I called up my mother, and I said, hey, mom, you know, I'm, guess what? I'm a VC now, which, you know, calling your Jewish mother and telling her you're, you're leaving the law, having just graduated from law school and passed the bar is like, you know, are you going to be a doctor? <laughs> no, mom. Sorry, bad news. Not going to be a doctor. I'm going to be a venture capitalist. She's like, yeah. Well, and what is that? You know, pray tell. You know? Uh, and so I described for her what a VC is. Oh, I do this. I do VC. I do this. I do that. And um, and I remember my mother saying she would. I'm sure she now would deny it. She'll see this video because she finds all videos that I'm in. She like. She must have a Google alert. Uh, so she said, Mom, you, you, I swear you said this. Uh, she said to me, I can't believe it. You talked your way into a job that only involves talking. <laughs> <laughs> and then she said, like, oh, that's the perfect job for you, <laughs> which I think is fair. Uh, anyway, so, so, you know, I came into the venture business not really understanding the structure of the business or what my job entailed or what was... You know, what was expected of me, all these things. It was, my, you know, my training when I got here was, hey, David, you're here, great. Uh, our partner meeting's at noon. That was the full training for the venture business that I received. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Um, so I'm just going to give you, a, uh, like, two seconds on the structure of venture capital. Maybe you guys know it, maybe you don't. And then that'll set us up for understanding, okay, how, do you know, how have companies raised money traditionally and then what has shifted recently in those sources of capital. And I'll try and highlight as, as I go along that we're going to see people, uh, you know, hear from people who are in each aspect of this business and, how it, and, and we may 
be able to poke at, you know, why is this different and why have you chosen to be different and why do you think that's a better path? You know, because what I will say is August Capital is a very traditional Series A investor. There are six partners. We by and large invest in, in your classic Series A companies. We invest in, in uh, you know, when early and we hope that the companies get bigger and we've had a, a, a lucky and great history of that working. The partners at August were the earliest investors in uh, everything from Microsoft, Sun, Compaq, Intuit to more recently things like uh, Splunk and Zulily. So, you know, long history of touching interesting businesses early and then hoping that they get very big. Um, but we watch these shifts in the industry and they definitely affect us. And then we have these strategy meetings where we sit around and we say, so so and so is doing this, should we do that? And we have a long conversation, then we go, nah. <laughs> you know, and then we have, oh, so and so is doing this, maybe we should try that. And we go, no, we're not gonna do that. We, we're gonna do what we do. Um, so I'm gonna describe those things now. I've already wasted all of my 10 minutes. Um, and then, you know, as we go through the, this semester, you'll get to see these things and you'll say it and, and let, People explain to you, like, why, why is David a dope? Like, why have you chosen to do this thing while David has continued to be a, your, your, you know, to, to cling to the historical model of venture capital? So, so how does venture work, right? Venture capitalists are uh, basically are part of a partnership. We manage a pool of money, and then we invest in companies, and, we, and when they get bigger, we hope to then sell the capital we have and, 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 or sell the equity we have and distribute it. So it's a, it's a pretty simple model. We, we form a partnership, and we raise money from, uh, from what we call LPs, limited partners. So it's literally a partnership, and the limited partners, the limitation they have is they give us money. And then they, that's, it. that's more or less what they get to do. And then we, the GPs, the general partners, then get to do everything else. Um, and so what you'll do is you'll go out and you say, I'm going to raise a $500 million fund, right? And, uh, and so we'll go and, and basically you, you, you fundraise the same way entrepreneurs do. In fact, I have a blog called Venture Blog, and I wrote about this after we raised our last fund, that I think that it's an incredible, incredibly valuable process for everybody to fundraise at some point because you have to explain yourself. You have to say, how are we different? Why is this the right management team? Why, why does it make sense for you to give us $500 million? So we go out, we talk to a bunch of limited partners and we say, here's what we're going to do and we're gonna take your $500 million, we're gonna invest it in companies and we're gonna turn it into more than $500 million which we're gonna give back to you. And it's that simple. Now it turns out they don't just send you $500 million. They, you say, okay, and we're gonna start by send us 10% of what you said you'd give us. So if you, in, you're gonna invest 50 million, we'll say, give us the five, we'll call you later for the rest. And over the course of a 10 year period, you basically call the, 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 the full $500 million, which you invest in companies. Um, so the, the, the typical, limited partners are folks like foundations or fund of funds, which are you know, individuals who, like me, are investing other people's money, but they're investing in venture funds. So you'll meet Chris DuVos, who is a fund of funds manager in the, in the LP world. Um, he has a blog called Super LP. You can give him a hard time about that. Like, mm, who made you Super LP? Uh, but I guess when you name your blog, you get to name it anything you want. I was Venture Blog, and he was Super LP. I'm just saying, Duvos. Uh, so, uh, but he's the only guy actually in the LP community who was willing to talk about, write about the limited partner world, right? So we have, you know, raised money from folks like Yale and the Ford Foundation, the MacArthur Foundation, and uh, and sometimes wealthy individuals, and sometimes and these funds of funds and um, and institutions, and and so you go out and you say, well, great. And if you're lucky, and there was a period of time from about 2008 until relatively recently where it was near impossible to raise a fund. Because venture, if you look, there's been a recent report that came out that says that the returns on venture capital in the last 10 years, now it's probably shifted. So about two years ago, the, year, the kind of 2000 to 2010, the return on a dollar in the venture industry as a whole was negative. So you made less than a dollar on that dollar invested. So why would you invest in the venture industry? It's mystifying. On the other hand, if you look, the returns from the, from the top, let's say 10% of the venture funds basically made up all of the returns in the industry. The bottom 50% 
lost a huge amount more than 10 cents on the dollar. Uh, again, raising the question, like, how could those folks have ever raised a fund? But it was very difficult to raise funds. But if you had the good fortune and of being, a, being in, in that top decile, then you raise this $500 million fund. And, um, and the way you get paid is two ways. One, you have this thing called the management fee. And the management fee is a percentage of the dollars that you're managing. So typically 2%. So if you raise a $500 million fund, then you get $10 million as a management fee to manage that money. Now, it turns out that's annual. I shouldn't be saying this on video. But it turns out that's annual. So you get $10 million a year to manage your $500 million fund over a 10-year period of time. Now, it may get smaller at the end or whatever. But essentially, it's lots and lots of dollars to go manage, manage those funds. And then you get this thing called the carry. And the carry is either the thing you never see because you never actually make any money and lots of funds never had any carry checks, or the thing that makes you phenomenally wealthy. If you were in the WhatsApp deal, <laughs> with Sequoia was the only investor, they owned a huge amount of that company. Um, then you get this thing called the carry, which is somewhere between 20 and 30% of the total gain. So if you bet, invest $10 million and it turns into a billion, you, a billion, $10 million, because it's easier math, then you get 20% of a billion dollars. So $200 million goes to the partners of the firm. $800 million goes to the investors. Now you would say, why in the world would the investors let the partners make so much money? It's because they made 800 million bucks. So how mad could you be? Like, oh, I can't believe you made 200. You go, yeah, but you made 800. Oh, okay, well, never mind. Uh, go do that again, and and we'll be happy. Um, and so that's the structure: is you know, we we buy equ we buy uh, equity in companies at a, at a given price. We hope the companies get bigger and more interesting. At some point, we hope there's liquidity. That's that's either the sale of the company or uh, or an IPO. Or recently, occasionally, someone else buys the shares from you in a secondary transaction, which is a very strange thing, like that you might get liquid because someone else is willing to take on the risk. Isn't my job to take on the risk? Yes, it is. So why would someone else, why would I sell to someone else if I'm selling? They're idiots because I think that I'm ready to you know, get out. And then when they make a ton of money, I'm an idiot because like, oh, how'd they make a ton of money? Why'd you sell? You're an idiot. So, so it's a complicated uh, relationship. So. All right, so, how, so uh, how many minutes have I actually already gone on? Uh, have another 10? Can I have 10, 10 more minutes? Anyone voting? Uh, all right, so, so the venture industry is, uh, it historically has been a very simple thing, which is that there have been angel investors who have gotten companies started. Angel investors historically have literally been rich people who have said, oh, you need some capital to get started. Here's $100,000, know, go, go for it. Um, the, uh, the um, Subway Sandwiches is actually, the, the company is called Doctors and Dentists, Inc. or something, or Dentists and Doctors, Inc., because that's where the money came from. That was the old angel investing model, is you get money from doctors and dentists who have extra money and say, all right, I'll try it. Um, and, then there were, and then there emerged an industry of traditional early stage investment firms here on Sand Hill Road. Um, actually, the very first was in Boston, invested in Digital Equipment Corporation, where my dad, my dad was a, a software engineer. But, um, but they, it emerged here, and, and those early investments were amazing because you could basically, for a very small number of dollars, buy a very large percentage of companies. And uh, we weren't talking about companies raising tens of millions of dollars. They were raising millions of dollars to try and build businesses. And if they were lucky, those businesses turned into lots of money. My partner, Dave Marquardt, was the only private investor in Microsoft. By the time he funded Microsoft, it was profitable. He put in a relatively small number of millions of dollars, and then obviously it went public and became Microsoft. Um, so it was good times back then. There wasn't a huge amount of competition. It was a strange business. Nobody aspired to be a venture capitalist. If you ever had said to your, to your mother, like, I, you know, when I grow up, I want to be a venture capitalist, First of all, you would have been like, what in the world is that? And then when you described it, your mother would have said, no. Like, what else? What else have you got? Dentist? Doctor? Try that. Um, so that was the, that was the history. And, and there's been a very interesting evolution that we'll see in this class of that industry, which is to say that the angel industry has shifted dramatically. The Series A world, the you know, classic venture investors have shifted dramatically. And the late stage world has shifted dramatically. Um, 
and each one through the impetus of particular individuals and funds that have happened over time. So, um, so quickly, you know, the angel, angel investing, as I said, started out as, as wealthy individuals. That was then angel clubs. There are still angel organizations like New York City Angels, Silicon Valley Angels, where a bunch of wealthy people get together, they hear a pitch, they decide collectively to put money in, and they get, and then they, uh, you know, and they help companies get launched. Um, there's a guy in New York who runs New York City Angels named David Rose who's about to write or has written a book that's about to launch called Angel Investing. Uh, and David has been angel investing forever. His family has been angel investing forever. It is the traditional model. We have money. We're going to invest in a, a bunch of companies. We're going to, and we hope, and we'll hope that they get to the point where they raise venture capital because really that is the goal. The goal is get big enough that you can ultimately raise venture capital. And in some instances, companies don't need more money, but that's pretty rare. Um, so that that historically is what happened in them. But what happened in the angel business is in the in um, in the late, in, in sort of the first bubble in the late 90s when the internet was emerging, uh, Ron Conway started this fund called Silicon Valley uh, SV Angels. And SV Angels, he had this realization that look, all these, that it, just getting into the interesting deals mattered. And so he created a fund where he got money from all the people who were likely to see those most interesting deals. So you give me your money, tell me about your good deals, I'll invest it, It'll, and, we'll, and it's a win win, we'll all do great. Um, and this and this was the emergence, to my knowledge, of sort of the first professional angel fund, where you know you gathered, collected up a bunch of money, invested in a set of set of uh, uh, companies, and then um, and then see how it goes and and sh and share the proceeds. Um, that that firm ended up having a challenging time in the in the early 2000s when the internet bubble burst, but it set the tone for what what emerged then in the 2000s uh, with with folks like Josh Koppelman who started First Round Capital. So you guys know First Round Capital. Josh Koppelman is a success. And by the way, there's a long history in angel investing of angels coming from companies, right? Where you, know, you, you start a company, you're successful, you make a lot of money, you, you emerge from the company, you're trying to figure out what to do next. You have all this money, you're not gonna retire. You're, you, worked really hard and maybe you don't want to work that hard again. <laughs> and so I say, well, how can I stay involved in startups? Well, I'll invest in them and I'll help you build your business, but you'll do the real work and I'll, you know, because I've made all this money. And so there's this long history of people who have been successful in, in their own startups then becoming the angel investors who help the next, next round of, uh, of companies. And so Josh Koppelman was one of those guys. He had, had one uh, successful business. He started a second called Half.com. He sold it to eBay, made a lot of money. He was a very thoughtful and smart entrepreneur out in, out in um, uh, Philadelphia, uh, of all places. Um, and he started investing in a bunch of companies and he realized quickly that he was gonna not have enough money. Like that, to do it, you know, he was an operator and to, to engage in the, the act of investing at the scale he wanted to, he wasn't gonna have a sufficient amount of money to do it. He also had people he wanted to work with, folks like Howard Morgan, who had been, who had been involved in the venture industry and the and the and the, and the angel industry for a long time. And so he created First Round Capital, which was the first at the time what was called Super Angel Fund, uh, which was a bunch of bunch of money gathered from like just like a venture fund from investors to then invest in as a, as an angel investor to to do that first round of capital to put put five hundred thousand dollars in or two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in and and help companies get to that next level where they would then raise venture money and so quickly following josh were a bunch of other folks that uh that started firms things like floodgate capital mike maples and ann Mirako started or soft tech vc which is jeff clavier's fund um and so you know, suddenly the angel business isn't just these individuals, it's now a professionalized experience and it's grown even more so. And now in fact, it, it's gotten to the point where it's, you know, sort of, uh, there are angel funds with a, per, with a very specific focus. So, you know, you have Social Plus Capital, which is Chamath's uh, fund. He was the head of marketing at Facebook. He came out, he wanted to see how you could use, you know, the social world to impact his investments. And so he started a fund that was focused on that. Um, we, we will see um, uh, Aspect Partners, which is uh, a couple of very successful women in the venture business who have, who have left their firms. Uh, Teresa Gao, is, who was at what, Excel, uh, is now 
uh, joining forces with Jennifer Fonstad to do early stage investing. Uh, I don't know if it's focused entirely on women in tech, but um, but again, with a focus and an, and an understanding that there's an opportunity to get in early and do something interesting. So, so suddenly we have these professional angels who are who now are creating this plethora of companies. I mean, one of the reasons there are so many companies now is twofold. One. It's way cheaper to start businesses than it was before. It used to cost a lot of money to, to get any technology business started. It still does if you want to do something in hardware or whatever, but it's still even cheaper in that. You have contract manufacturing. You have a lot, lots more resources. Now, if you want to start a software company, you use AWS or you use Google or, you, you know, or, 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 uh, or you know, now Salesforce has the infrastructure with Heroku. To build a business on top of this very cheap commoditized infrastructure and it costs you a small amount of money. So now it's easy to start a company and there's a ton of angel money that's out there. And so instead of hundreds of companies, there are thousands of companies getting started. Um, and that's been a, a very big shift. Um, I, I'll just say quickly that there have been these funds that sort of feel like they're, um, they're sort of like the angel funds, but also like series A funds, Folks like True Ventures and Union Square Ventures. I, I, I suspect I would characterize Elsop Louie in that in that category. Is that a fair yeah. place to put them? Which is, you know, sort of tensions on both sides. Have enough capital to do a sort of six million dollar financing, but oftentimes competing with angels. Uh, so we'll you know we'll we'll uh, hear from uh, from Gilman Louie. Is that who's coming? Uh, Gilman will talk with us about um, about that piece of the world. Um, Crowdfunding. Crowdfunding has emerged and become quite interesting. Uh, a guy named Naval Ravikant started this thing called Angels List, and Angels List is basically how do you throw your your information out there, make it available and widely known, reach out to a very broad range of people who otherwise wouldn't have access to uh, to your um, uh, to your ideas and raise money. And now they've created a thing where you have syndicates. And syndicates are just like mini venture funds. So there are people, um, uh, Gil Pinchina, who, uh, who I work with on a company called Fastly, has a syndicate of over a million dollars. And what that means is that he can invest the, the initial money, some, let's say $50,000 or $100,000, and then promise another $900,000 or a million dollars alongside him to get a financing done. So suddenly, you know, Gil, as an individual using Angels List, has become a fund, right? You don't have to go raise money from six or ten different people. You just say, hey, Gil, I want you to do it. He commits. Everybody else follows. Boom, it's done. And you have things like Kickstarter. You have things like uh, Indiegogo. And soon we'll have these, these equity crowdfunding platforms, courtesy of the Jobs Act, that just say, look, you know, you can buy $1,000 worth of shares, $500 worth of shares. I mean, it'll be a very interesting... Um, very interesting evolution. I, I think it will end in tears and heartbreak, but it will be interesting. Um, so it's just a, it, it, it's amazing to think that that this that this early stage layer has gotten so broad and intense and uh, and lots and lots of dollars. Uh, one you know one more aspect of that is is the what was in the late '90s there were these things called incubators and incubators were things where smart people came up with ideas and then they hired people to work on them. You know it's like a, Mad, mad scientist, Mwahaha, I will create the Google Glass, now build it, and make me wealthy. Uh, those are five minutes. Uh, and those things didn't work terribly well, although, you know, Idea Lab is still out there. Bill, Bill Gross is an incredibly smart guy, and he's had some interesting ideas, and he's had some successes. But what those have turned into are these accelerators, and accelerators are Really, okay, come and we will give you a little bit of money, we'll give you some attention, we'll teach you some of the tricks to how to build a big business, and then, uh, and then buy, and increasingly the real value of these things is we'll, we'll put you as part of a community of entrepreneurs, and then we'll give you access to investors. And that community of entrepreneurs and access to investors is incredibly valuable to an, to an entrepreneur who's getting started. And so you know, Y Combinator has been very successful at driving lots and lots of people to apply. You know, they have many times more applicants than they do people who they admit into the program. They give a relatively small amount of money, some, some attention, and then access. And those companies then hopefully turn into big businesses. And in Y Combinator's case, they were the you know they 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 were the beginnings of Dropbox and and Airbnb and Heroku uh, and uh, and 
others. So, uh, and then there's been this, then there were a set of others that had emerged, things like Accelerate in Chicago, um, there's a new Disney Accelerator, but those seem to be merging now and consolidating under the Techstars program, which was like the competitor Y Combinator. So you have Y Combinator, and then around the world you have Techstars, and Techstars now has eaten the Chicago program, and now there's Techstars Chicago. They've just created an, what looks to be a really cool accelerator down in, uh, in LA with Disney, the Disney Accelerator under Techstars, and so you can get the resources of Disney. You know, you look at the, the people who are advisors at that, um, other than me, uh, although I am. Uh, but then there, you know, it's like the senior executives of Disney and me. So which, who are you calling me? Hey, Bob. That's who I call. Um, so it's it's been very interesting to see how how again get and, and then you have uh, 500 startups. You know, you have Dave McClure who says I'm going to fund 500 startups. Well, he's well past 500 at this point. I don't know what number he's at, but so, I don't know if he's going to have to change it. The problem is he's going to have to keep buying new URLs when it, you know a thousand startups. 2,000 startups. <laughs> so, um, so, so that's the that's the bottom. That's the sort of, you know, the core ultimately of the venture business is getting lots and lots of seed capital. In fact, I've spent a bunch of time talking with the folks at other, in other countries about how do you encourage an ecosystem, how do you encourage this this economy to get going. Um, and my answer is always three things. You, first and foremost, you need really good angel capital to help seed these things. Secondly, you need extremely good internet. And third, you need good coffee. Those three things, you also need very good smart entrepreneurs. But there are great entrepreneurs all around the world. So if you have awesome seed capital, good internet, and excellent coffee, you, you will be able to create the ecosystem. It just takes a while, you know? All right, let me just the last thing say that the, that the so the traditional VC model has also shifted, and I, and I won't get into it, but if you, Andreessen Horowitz has really rethought in many ways. They're t they talk about being, uh, what's, their, what's their phrase for operating? Agency model. What are the agency? So they, they're basically building resources that are going to help their startups. They have 100 people who are involved in like doing marketing and sales and all these things. Uh, we have six people. They have a hundred people, uh, and they say, "Like we're going to help you build your business." Uh, they've raised now billions of dollars, another billion and a half dollars, and and their and their focus is how do we create infrastructure that'll help you build your business? And increasingly, you'll see up and down Sand Hill Road people feeling the pressure of that, and they're starting to hire PR people to help their companies and recruiters and all those things. Um, in large part, I, I genuinely believe in, in reaction to the. The behemoth that is Andreessen Horowitz saying, like, here's what we bring you. You know, um, I bring you this. Uh, and then in the late stage world, very quickly, there has been also a shift, and the shift came when um, there, historically there have been late stage venture funds, folks like Meritech Capital or, you know, um, uh, uh, so Jules, who's from IVP, is another guy, Jules Maltz, who's going to talk to us. They have a lot of money. They invested in late stage deals. The companies were already working. They helped give you the capital to scale or get to that public or whatever. So there have been historically these funds that that was their job. All of a sudden, people like Yuri Milner came in from nowhere and said, like, wait a second, I see an opportunity here. I have a ton of money uh, and, and, and invested at what was, seemed to be an obscene valuation in Facebook uh, and made him more money than most venture firms will ever make. Uh, and that and opened people's eyes. David Z from Greylock had the very smart realization in the in the early 2000s that he could invest in Facebook at what again seemed a very high valuation, but get what's called senior preference, which means that his money would come out first. So he said, "Look, if this doesn't work, my money comes out first. So there's not a lot of downside risk, but there's a bunch of upside opportunity, and therefore I'm going to use structure to protect myself." and not worry about price. And so we're, here, we're seeing a ton of investors now who are saying, like, we really almost don't care about the price. We're going we're gonna to create structure that says, in fact, we even saw this when, um, uh, what's the book selling company that went public? Chegg. When Chegg went public, their last round of investors had cut a deal that said, if you go public at a price that's lower than this price, you'll give us the shares to make up the difference. It was, like, it was called a ratchet. And so it was like, you know, we will never do worse than this. And so when the company went public, they had to issue a bunch of new shares. And so those investors got a guaranteed return. 
as long as Chegg didn't go out of business. So those are interesting models, and we're seeing lots and lots of pressure um, as these as people are investing larger dollars at higher prices. And Andreessen's doing this a lot, and Google Ventures. I mean, you know, Google Ventures is its own its own beast. It, they have this internal source of capital that is near infinite, <laughs> the golden goose that is Google. They have a massive, massive group of people. They're using both Google as an infrastructure to figure out what they think is interesting, plus data, plus a lot of people, and then similarly being relatively insensitive to price and you know, to valuation and those sorts of things and putting a lot of money into things. And, and, and as long as we're riding this up market that we've been seeing, which has been spectacular, Many of these people will do well. <laughs> what will be very interesting, and you guys will th think back on this moment when the time comes and the market starts falling, what happens to all of these models when the market starts falling? Because these models all, were, all are working, and they're working great as we, have this, as we have this bull market. But man, oh man, when it turns around, suddenly it's going to be a different and more challenging thing. So those are the, those are the uh, you know, sort of, shifting waters, shifting sands of the venture business. We'll meet people who play in each of them. I look forward to you all you know, questioning each of them like to see if they can justify their, their existence. <laughs> uh, and now I'm going to give you two seconds to question my existence, uh, and then, we'll, then we can move on with the rest of the class. So, uh, so what is usually the amount of uh, money you invest in late stage ventures? It's, it's incredibly uh, um, uh, varied at this point, right? It used to be much more consistent. It was some $20 million or something that you'd invest in drive business. And now you see it. You see, oh, yeah, some, you know, someone raises 100 and I mean, the one that's unbelievable, Intel just put $700 million into Cloudera. $700 million. This is a software business. What would you have done with $700 million when you were building these businesses? Like, party. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and then we consistently see firms putting in $75, $100, $100 million into these businesses. And these are businesses that, in the end, should be capital efficient. You know, what do venture investors want? We'd love an understanding of your business model and, and, and capital efficiency, ideally. Some of them are saying, well, look, we can understand the ROI on a lot of dollars, right? If you can turn a dollar into three, even though, even though it takes a long time or takes a bunch of expense up front, here's $100 million, turn it into $300 million. So it's, it's, it's pretty wild to watch. It will change when the thing starts doing that. So how's, uh, how's your firm sort of adapt to the shift in the VC world? Well, actually, the, what we have, you know, there are a set of firms, I'd say, that you know, folks like August and Benchmark and uh, and others that have stayed small and have not hired a bunch of external people and all those things. Our view is that the venture business is about being being helpful and having real relationships and helping you to build build businesses and more importantly, helping you to build your own business. Right? That we're not here to provide you with the a, you know a set of services when you should be developing those. Right? You know. I funded Splunk when it was three people and an interesting idea. What they needed was to figure out if the software worked and if there was a market for it. When it came time to start selling or whatever, then they needed to build an inside sales team. They needed to build a PR resource. You know, Now there are 1,000 people, and they, and they have all of those things in-house, and they have the resources they need to do it. And I think that those of us that have stayed small and focused think that the, the value of, business, of these businesses is that they can... You know that they can build something spectacular on their own, and that we're there to there to to help them in any way we can, but not to, you know, not to take away from the business that they're building. Right. So, but that's a very traditional view, right? And that's the view that's been taken by the Kleiner and all the different VCs. So, are you saying that these new models or these new sort of um, sort of ideas are just like noise, and eventually the one that went out is the traditional model? Well, you know, there is a history of it. There were a number of firms that were doing a set of the things that are now being done by Andreessen and others in the late 90s. I see. And, and they didn't play out. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't, you know, look, at the end of the day, my job as an investor is to invest in great companies and have them be successful. Right. Now, what they're doing is going to do one of two things. Either it's going to help their companies be more successful, and I think that that's, that, that at best is a marginal value. 
right? I, I do not believe that the, that the most successful businesses are going to be that much more successful by virtue of it. And more importantly, I don't think that unsuccessful businesses will suddenly be successful by virtue of it. The other thing that it might do is help them get better deals, you know, essentially be good marketing, be good opportunity to, to convince people to take your money. And I think that actually that, they, that has been quite successful. So if that works, it may, that may be more than sufficient. But yes, we take a traditional view, which is that all of this stuff is not changing the nature of the venture business, which is our business is to help you be successful, to find entrepreneurs, to have real relationships, and then do, do the sets of things that, that VCs have traditionally done, right? There's no one in the organization at one of these firms that isn't the partner who is gonna get on the phone with a candidate to be the CTO of a business and convince them that the company is, that they should join this company other than the partner, right? That's what we do, right? Is what, this is how, how we think about the business. So um, in the end, there are a set of things that will still be best handled by partners uh, who have real relationships with the companies. And, and again, the other thing that you'll see is as the, uh, if the market were to turn around and start being challenging, then it's really, you know, you need the help and the relationships and the focus of, of the partners in these venture firms to say, I'm willing to give you more money. I'm willing to focus on this business and bet on it Exceed, you know, getting out of this challenge in time. This is the last question. Um, you mentioned a couple of times uh, the possibility of a, I'm sorry. You mentioned a couple of times the possibility of a turn down in the market. I mean, as a venture capitalist, do you in some way see the writing in the walls or, you know, do you think that there's a certain timetable for these sorts of things or I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I took a, 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 I was teaching at Stanford's business school. I took a group of 40 students to China. This was two and a half years ago, I think. And we were sitting down with the head of the public markets in China, and, uh, and he said something to the effect of, you know, we had a little bit of a, the, the market had a, a little glitch and was trending down a little bit before it trended back up, and it created a whole bunch of uh, uh, angst in the, com in the Chinese communities because they were like, oh, markets can go down? Like, <laughs> you know, that's like, we aren't betting on this market to go down, we're betting on the market to go up, right? Um, that's crazy, of course. And so you can't have a market that only goes up. Anyone who's been in the industry for any reasonable period of time has seen the market go up and down. And in fact, you know, one of the challenges you have when you're new to, you know, lots of people who are in the business now are new to the venture business and didn't see those cycles, right? My partners have been in the business for 30 some odd years and seen many of those cycles. I got here right at the front end of the crash of the initial bubble, then saw it sort of working through 2008, a real, real catastrophic tr problem from 2008 to nine and then this incredible run up. So it will happen. There isn't any, you know, the market will not go up forever. It's, it's just not gonna happen. So, you know, do I think it's gonna happen now or what? You know, I, I'm no more, uh, I, 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 can, I can predict the future no, no better than the rest of you. Maybe you guys probably are better than I, uh, wisdom of the crowds, but, um, but the time will come, and so people have to be thoughtful about. Here's how you, you know, here's how you think about the business in an up market, and here's how you think about the business in a down market. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.